So what are load balancers and what do they do? It's kind of in the name. They balance incoming traffic to your application and can then distribute that traffic across multiple servers so that none of them are being overloaded or underutilized. The reason we want to do this is that it improves reliability and scalability of our web application. It can allow us to add or subtract servers for dynamic scaling. So if you have, uh, let's say like Amazon, during Christmas season or Black Friday, they have way more traffic than usual. A load balancer will allow them to scale up on their back end during those peak traffic periods. And during less busy times, they could scale down and save money. It also increases reliability. So instead of having one single point of failure, we can have multiple replicas of our app running on the back end. And if one of those has a hardware failure, or something like that, we can route that traffic to another replica and our service will stay up. There are two types. We have software or hardware based load balancers. An example of software are Nginx and HAProxy, which are gaining in popularity because they can run on any commodity server. F5 and Citrix are um, hardware based. They can handle tons of traffic because they're specifically designed only to be load balancers but one of the reasons these are falling out of favor is because it can lead to vendor lock-in and each of these things costs like ten thousand dollars or more can go up into the hundreds of thousands for very big data centers now let's get a visual so you can kind of picture this all in your head and understand it conceptually so what we have here is your standard setup where you have users they make a request the internet then routes that to your domain, which is an IP address behind that where your web server is. Your web server will be something like Nginx or Apache, which you may have heard of, and that web server will then route it to your application. That would be something like ExpressJS, LampStack, Django, WordPress. Your application is um, the code you write, and that will interact sometimes with the database or just deliver back some content, like a blog post or something. This works perfectly fine for most cases, just because you don't need um, to really over, over complicate it. Uh, but for stuff that's mission critical or that's taking a lot of traffic, you don't want this single point of failure. In this case, if this web server goes down or the server that it's hosted on goes down, nobody's gonna be able to access your website. So for more um, basically complex apps that people or businesses are relying on, this is your basic load balancer setup. We now have in between our web servers, we have this load balancer where the traffic is routed. The load balancer can then distribute this traffic to our web servers and these are essentially isolated. So if one of these even goes down, the load balancer can still direct this to the secondary replica. There's a lot of different ways that you can set up your load balancer to route traffic, and these are some of the most common. So the simplest is probably round robin, where your load balancer has a list of servers that are available, and it will route them by just cycling through each server. So as the, re as the requests come in, it'll just continuously um, cycle through that list and send the next request to that server. The problem with this is that for certain applications, not all requests are the same. Some can have very heavy database queries, and the result could be that just by chance, some of your servers could get hit with a lot of heavy queries, and it would lock up because it's doing a lot more work relative to the other ones. Second is least connections. So if you have an app that is doing chat or streaming applications where your users are staying persistently connected to the server, this is a way to make sure that none of the servers get too many connections the load balancer will communicate back and forth with the servers and keep track of how many connections each is currently serving and it will route to whatever server has the least at this moment it will route to that one least response time works by similarly communicating with the server and it times how long it takes for it to respond so if a server is handling a lot of traffic at the moment it's going to respond slower and the load balancer will then decide to respond or to route traffic to the ones that are currently not as slow. IP hash is useful for when you need to kind of maintain a session. So what happens there is that um, for certain applications, 
the client needs data that's stored on a particular server. So the way you do that is that you hash their IP address and that way every time that user sends a request, it will always go to the same server. An example of a use case like that would be for like a shopping cart. So if Amazon, when you're, they have tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of different servers, they're gonna have your shopping cart stashed on one particular server. So they wanna make sure that when you refresh a page, your request is sent to the same server that holds that data. There's two main types of load balancer, which is layer four and layer seven. Layer four is simpler, it has access to less data, and as a result, it's faster because it doesn't have to use as much processing power to look at each request. This can lead to uneven traffic because it doesn't have full access to the request itself. But a benefit of that is that it's good on the edge of your data center or of your network because it can look at the IP address and for example, if you're getting like a denial of service attack or some bad actor is going after your application, instead of wasting processing power allowing it through to your web server or your application server, you can just toss that request right at the edge. So a lot of data centers will first route all incoming traffic through a layer four load balancer before allowing it um, further into your application basically. Layer seven has full access to HTTP protocol and the data of the request. It can also terminate SSL and decrypt traffic and stuff like that. It can check for authentication. So if a user sends a request, they're not logged in, they're trying to get to a certain page, instead of letting that go to your application server right at the load balancer, you could redirect those people. And as a result of having access to um, the entire URL of the request and all the data within that, you have a lot of smarter routing options. It is more CPU intensive to run a layer seven load balancer, but with the uh, drop in cost of hardware in general over the years, um, it's really not a big factor anymore. Finally, let's look at an actual production load balancer setup. Earlier, we just had a single load balancer, which uh, would be kind of stupid because we talked about single point of failure. If you have only a single load balancer, you've just moved the problem up a little bit. Instead of having a single a web server, you now have a single load balancer. So in production, what uh, the general setup is that you have your active load balancer, which takes the traffic, but you also have a passive load balancer as well. So these will be in communication with each other. And if the passive load balancer detects something wrong with this, the traffic will then be routed to the passive load balancer, which starts taking that traffic while this is repaired or fixed with um, whatever's wrong with either the hardware or at the software level. And behind this, it's then just the same thing where you have um, all your different web servers and applications that are accepting that traffic. So that's it for a brief overview of load balancers and the general concepts. There's a lot more um, details for advanced use cases and you can look those up, but this covers kind of the broad concepts of what they are, why you use them, and the general setup. If this video helped you out, uh, be sure to subscribe. I'll be doing a lot more videos covering system design. And if you have any confusion or questions, be sure to leave a comment below and I'll try to help you out.